Welcome back again, everyone. So we're going to continue where we left off yesterday, and uh, hmm, okay, it's very nice. <laughs> um, we're going to carry on, and yesterday we finished having a look at the uh, Baya Bhairava Sutta, Majjhimanikaya Four. Uh, and uh, the next sutta on our list is called the Upakilesa Sutta. And it's the sutta you're seeing here, it's number 128 of the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length sayings of the Buddha. And it kind of continues where we left off yesterday. Yesterday we were looking at how the Buddha was dealing with various kinds of problems uh, in his meditation. Yeah, he was going into the jungle uh, and he was experiencing all kinds of uh, things, uh, yeah, all kind of uh, uh, defilements that he was looking into, uh, and he kind of overcoming that by kind of facing his fear and dread, uh, and in that way understanding his own mind and overcoming these problems. And today we're going to continue with this idea of uh, looking at the defilements of the mind, uh, the things that block progress in meditation. Yeah, this is kind of what this is about. Uh, the main part of the sutta, and it still continues with the life of the Buddha, and in other words, how the Buddha dealt with these things. But this particular sutta is a very rich sutta. The content is very large and very broad. So we're going to look at all of these little details about how the path works and all kind of issues that come up in this marvelous, amazing, wonderful sutta. Uh, every sutta is wonderful and marvelous, but this one is really more wonderful and marvelous. <laughs> no, you can't really say that. They're all wonderful and marvelous. So, um, upakilesa, the, uh, the word upakilesa, as I mentioned before, is related to the word kilesa. In the sutta, as you find this word kilesa in many versions of it, you find upakilesa, you find sankilesa, and you find kilesa. And they mean roughly the same thing. It refers to defilements of the mind, corruptions of the mind, blemishes of the mind, problems of the mind, yeah? things that get in the way of the progress of developing and cultivating the mind in peace, tranquility, metta, compassion, all of these things that we're trying to develop. And uh, the word upakilesa specifically uh, refers to the refined defilements of the mind. Yeah, the more coarser defilements, uh, they are uh, often just called greed or ill will, yeah? but these are like the def refined defilements. Uh, and uh, the word upaklesa is used in the suttas, for example, to describe the five hindrances. Uh, the five hindrances are like the very last thing that you need to overcome to achieve samadhi. So the five hindrances really are about refined defilements of the mind. They're called upakilesa, at least one place in the suttas. Uh, often we think of the five hindrances as a very broad category, including all the defilements. But actually, if you look at the gradual training, the coarse defilements of the mind, they are overcome by a virtue, by living well, by, by speaking in the right way, acting in the right way. That's how the coarse defilements are overcome. And then the next stage is sense restraint. Uh, sense restraint is how to overcome the coarse defilements of ill will and greed and these kind of things. Uh, then there is clear awareness. Yeah, This is the um, Sampajanya, another stage on the path. And only when all of those things are done, only then do you overcome the five hindrances. Uh, so they are like the refined problems of the mind coming towards the very end of the path. Uh, and they are overcome basically through meditation practice, uh, while you're watching the breath. Yeah? Once mindfulness has been established, uh, then you watch the breath. Uh, you do the Satipatthana practice, uh, that is where these last defilements, the Nivarana, the five hindrances, the Upakilesa, where they are overcome. Uh, and this is very clear, we shall see this in the Sutta, it becomes very clear. Uh. The word upakilesa is also used elsewhere. It is used in, uh, in uh, the uh, Vatupama Sutta, Majjhima number 7. Vatupa means the simile of the cloth. Uh, you know that sutta, the simile of the cloth? Yeah, you know, yeah right. Uh, it's a beautiful sutta uh, found there in how if you're going to dye cloth, it has to be pure, first of all. You have to get rid of all the defilements of the cloth. Uh, if the cloth is not clean and nice, uh, it will not take the dye. It will not dye very nicely. Uh, 
In the same way, the mind has to be pure and bright uh, in order for insight to work properly. Uh, and in that sutta, you have a large number of uh, problems of the mind that are listed, all kind of things like, in addition to the normal list, like, uh, you know, being arrogant and having a domineering attitude and all of these kind of things. Uh, I hope I'm not too arrogant myself because uh, I, w I heard the other day maybe I'm a bit arrogant. I, I apologize if that's the case, but I, I try, I promise, I, I really try to overcome these defilements. So, so um, the, um, all of these things are also kind of considered refined defilements of the mind. Yeah, these, um, uh, all of these things. So this is kind of how the word upakilesa is used in the sutta. So just to give you a little bit of background for that. Uh, the word kilesa without the upa in front uh, usually is used just to mean uh, loba dosa moha, yeah? raga dosa moha. These are the three root defilements of greed, hatred, and delusion. Uh, I don't think greed, hate, and delusion are very, is a very good translation, to be honest with you, because loba and raga just means desire in a very general sense. Uh, um, dosa means ill will. It doesn't mean hate. Hate is a very strong word, right? If you hate someone, it's like... Uh, it's a very powerful emotion. It doesn't just mean that. It means any kind of ill will. And uh, moha means when your mind is confused or you don't know what's going on. Uh, delusion, okay, maybe a bit too profound, but it's okay. Uh, that's where kilesa is used. And then sankilesa is used often when the word is compounded with other words. Uh, then you find the word sankilesa. The sang in front doesn't change the meaning all that much. Uh, so um, this sutta then, uh, is part of a number of suttas uh, that actually deal with the same, uh, the same kind of um, set of ideas, if you like, or they, they deal with the same incident, I should say. Uh, and this whole sutta is uh, based around the incident called the incident at Kosambi. Uh, this sutta is spoken at Kosambi. Have you heard about Kosambi before? Yeah, Kos okay, Kosambi. Yeah, okay, Kosambi, one of the great cities in ancient India. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, the, the argument that Kosambi, precisely. I would, this is what this is going to be about, actually, in a second. Huh? But Kosambi was also one of the five great cities of ancient India. You had uh, what you had: Rajagaha, Savati. Uh, you had uh, Kosambi, Varanasi, huh? and then you had Champa. I think was the last one of these five great cities in ancient India. Six, actually, six great cities. What am I saying now? Kosambi, okay, anyway, something like that, close enough. <laughs> if you want to check it out, look at the Maha Parnibana Sutta, Diganikai 16. That's what the great cities of ancient India are talked about, but Kosambi is one of them. I think Vesali may have been one of them as well, actually. Um, and uh, the, uh, so there's a number of suttas that kind of revolve around this uh, uh, idea. And uh, for example, in the Vinaya Pitaka, which is what I have translated, Myself, uh, uh, in that Vinipitaka, this incident is also talked about, but it gives a broader view of what is happening. So I'm going to bring in some of the ideas from the Vinipitaka as well. Uh, and uh, some of the verses that are found in the Sutta, very beautiful verses. Uh, yeah, we'll look at those in a second. The one about uh, hatred is not, never overcome by hatred, uh, hatred is overcome by love. Uh, this is an eternal law. Uh, yeah, this comes in this particular sutta, also found in the Vinaya, also found in the Dhammapada, right? So it, it is found kind of, you can really know it is a core verse, it is found so broadly across the suttas. Uh, and, um, so, uh, and the famous story of the Parileyaka forest, uh, you know the story of the Parileyaka forest? Uh, you know this, I'm sure you do when I, when I tell you the story, it's the famous story of the, the monkey that gives the honey to the Buddha, huh? you know that story? Huh? There's a famous story, the monkey gives the honey to the Buddha, the elephant uh, is the upatak of the Buddha, the huh? li Buddha is living in the Paralayaka forest, uh, and uh, the monkey gives the honey to the uh, Buddha, right, and he's hanging on this branch, and he gets so happy when he gives the honey to the Buddha, huh, that he falls off the branch, falls out of the tree, crashes to the ground, he gets reborn straight into the heavenly realm. Uh. <laughs> It's a, it's a cute story, isn't it? Uh, can I just imagine this monkey getting so excited for being such a, doing such an act of generosity towards the Buddha. Uh, that's where that story comes from. Uh, and uh, that story varies a little bit because, again, it exists in many places. It's part of the Jataka or Jataka or Dhammapada Atakata, I'm not sure. Uh, and it's also part of the Vinaya. And there are various versions of that story. All of these things come together yeah, in one kind of large 
group of suttas coming together. They're all relating to each other in a sense. So uh, this is what we're going to have a look at. So let's just start, uh, and then I'm going to kind of meander a bit, uh, like, a, like we usually do, back and forth, uh, and talk about this content. So as usual, uh, the sutta starts off by saying, so, I've have, so I have heard. Uh, at one time the Buddha was staying near Kosambi in Gosita's monastery. Uh, so Kosambi was the largest city in the Chaiti, uh, Republic, yeah, the Chaiti country, the 16 large countries uh, at the time of the Buddha, the north of India was divided into 16 countries, uh, the Chaiti was one of those. Uh, and uh, there are, these countries are enumerated in the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, 16, elsewhere there's only 9 I think, the number varies a little bit, uh, but uh, this is how north, the north of India was uh, divided in those days, Kosambi was one of the capitals. Uh, and Gosita's monastery, there was probably a fellow called Gosita who had given this monastery here. Uh, not only men gave monasteries, sometimes we think about Indian culture and we think of it as very kind of male-dominated culture. Uh, but uh, even in ancient India, there were also wealthy women uh, who would give monasteries to the Sangha. And one of those famous monasteries is the Pubarama. Pubarama means the Eastern Monastery. Uh, and it was given by Visaka. Yeah, you all heard about Visaka, yeah, one of the Buddha's chief uh, lay female lay disciples. Uh, and she was known as Visaka Migaramata. Migaramata means the mother of Migara. And Migara was her father-in-law, and she was the one who brought her father-in-law to the Dhamma. So she was a very uh, inspiring lady, Visaka. And there's some very nice stories about her in the uh, Vinaya and other places, uh, and very interesting stories. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about them here. <laughs> next year maybe, so come back next year, we'll hear about Visaka Migaramata. <laughs> this is how you prepare people to come back year after year. <laughs> so, we, are, we are experts at psychological manipulation, uh, the Buddhist monks. <laughs> All right. Okay, so... Now at that time, the mendicants of Kosambi were arguing, quarreling, and disputing, uh, continually wounding each other with barbed words. Then a mendicant went up to the Buddha, bowed, stood to one side, and told him what was happening, adding, Please, sir, go to those mendicants out of compassion. Yeah, so... Um, uh, here we have the Sangha uh, is arguing, uh, uh, and uh, this of course happens because Sangha, bhikkhus, bhikkhunis are just like ordinary people. Uh, not everyone is maybe ordinary, some people are arahants, but uh, of course uh, the majority of the Sangha is going, always going to be just ordinary people, and so you expect to find ordinary defilements also in the Sangha, and this is what you're finding, seeing here. And it's kind of nice to know that even at the time of the Buddha, huh, the Sangha was not, you know, there's not all Arahants and all kind of, uh, you know, marvelous people. Uh, there are, there were ordinary people then, just like there are ordinary people now. Huh? Sometimes people think that, oh, at the time of the Buddha, easy to get enlightened because, you know, everyone was really kind of pure and beautiful and powerful. Not at all. Exactly the same defilements then as people have now. If you want to know about the defilements of the Sangha or even lay people in those days, you can read the Vinaya Pitaka the, uh, about the conduct of the monastics. And sometimes you probably be shocked by some of those stories in the Vinaya Pitaka. They're really over the top sometimes. Uh, really kind of uh, cra crazy stuff going on even in those days. Uh. And so people are people, yeah? And uh, so it's not really shocking at all when you think about it. It's just people being people, uh, and people do all kinds of things. That's the nature of human beings. Uh, so it actually is to be expected. Uh. But uh, don't make it into an excuse uh, to think that at the time of the Buddha, yeah, easy to practice, now difficult. No, basically the difference isn't that great. Uh, and it is perfectly possible to practice now. Uh. They were continually wounding each other with barbed words. Yeah? And this is when you get into an argument, we can use words as weapons. Yeah? 
And uh, this is, of course, something we should really avoid as Buddhists to use words as weapons. Words can be incredibly hurtful. Sometimes a word can be more hurtful than a physical, you know, a physical kind of uh, hurting, right? Because they go straight to the mind. It's psychologically painful, and psychological pain can often be very, uh, very difficult to deal with. Uh, so for this reason, it's so important that we learn this idea of right speech in Buddhism. We don't hurt each other. Instead, we lift each other up. Uh, and we talk words that are gentle, uh, kind, uh, go to the heart, uh, uh, conducive to harmony, uh, yeah, and all of these kind of things that are meaningful and useful. Uh, and uh, so th words can be very, very problematic. And especially when we get into an argument, it's very easy to be led astray by these things. Uh, so this is... Uh, uh, vittu, uh, what is it? Mukka, mukka satehi vittu danta. You see the word mukka satehi here, over here. And mukka is the mouth, and satta or sati here is a sword, yeah? The sword of the mouth, uh, quite literally. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so you wound each other with the sword of the mouth. Vittu danta is a kind of wounding here, I think, yeah. So, uh, in other words, you have to be caref very careful how we use uh, our now, so what is going on here? Why are the monastics arguing here? Do you know the story behind that? Huh? Anyone know the story exactly why? Yeah, okay, of course. Okay, why Yin would know the story. So I, I apologize, Yin, I'm going to have to repeat everything you know already, so uh, please. Uh, <laughs> that's, it's some people, there's always some people in an audience like this who are very knowledgeable about the Dhamma, and that's wonderful that people are knowledgeable. I really, I really like that. But uh, anyway, I'm going to repeat it just for the benefit of everyone. Huh? And it's, it's kind of interesting yeah, when you know a little bit about why these things are happening. Yeah? And they are really arguing, and what is happening is that the Sangha is split into two camps. Yeah? There's one side and then there's the other side, and people are taking sides. Uh, yeah? And this is of course how you end up with a split in the Sangha. You get a schism, right? This is called the uh, uh, a sangha Beda in the Pali. Beda means like a split in the Sangha. And this is one of the really bad ideas, is to split the Sangha. Because once you split the Sangha, the whole world is very, gets very confused. Who is right? Who is wrong? And people lose interest in Buddhism. They go astray and they become Christians, or they become atheists, or they become believers in Thor and Odin. Have you heard about Thor and Odin? These are my old gods before I was a Buddhist. I believed in Thor and Odin. These are the Nordic, the Nordic gods, right? Uh, Valhalla, that's right. That's the heaven of the Thor and Odin. You go to heaven and you continue drinking and fighting in heaven. That's kind of the, the, that's the Viking idea of heaven. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and uh, so uh, the Sangha is uh, getting divided because they are disputing. But what is kind of fascinating here is the thing that they are disputing about. Uh, and you would think that this is something very major, right? You think this is about kind of the meaning of Nibbana or kind of something like that. Yeah, the, the precise definition of the jhanas or how to practice or whatever. Something really important that actually makes the whole difference for whether Buddhism is going to survive or not. This is really, really important. Uh, so do you think that it's really, really important? Or what do you think? Yeah. What, what kind of any, uh, any guesses here? Of course, not really. Human nature is not like that. Uh, human nature is like we argue over the small things in life, right? Uh, have you noticed that in your own life, how often you end up arguing about the small things? Uh, this, is kind of, this is humanity for you. This is exactly how we are. Uh, and these monastics were exactly the same. And so the argument, what it is about, there was a monk, he had been to the toilet, right? Uh, yeah, been to the bathroom. Uh, and after finishing his business in the toilet, uh, there was a little pitcher, a little kind of you know, jug or whatever, that used for rinsing, yeah, water, water, water in the toilets. Uh, and after he had finished kind of using this water in the toilet, uh, he left water in the pitcher. Uh, and leaving water in the pitcher is considered a no-no. You're not supposed to leave water in the pitcher. And this was what this argument was about. Uh, you left water in the pitcher. But that is not an offense. Yes, it is an offense. No, not an offense. Yes, it is an offense. No, not an offense. And then this way, the argument started. Uh, it's kind of the smallest thing you can imagine almost, right? Whether you leave water in the pitcher in the toilet or not. It doesn't matter, right? It's completely irrelevant. Uh, but this is kind of the human nature. So how do we even get 
to that point. And very often the reason why we get to that point is that there are previous arguments, previous things, and this is like the str famous straw that breaks the famous camel's back, right? Uh, and then the camel can't take it anymore, the camel breaks down. Uh, and the kind of the two humps on the camel, they start to separate. You get a schism in the Sangha as a consequence. Uh, so this is, uh, this is how things happen, yeah? This is kind of how uh, we are often as human beings. And uh, so watch out for those things, because very often the reason why we argue in this way is because there are underlying, unresolved issues in our life. So make sure that you always resolve your issues. Uh, if you start to feel that things are getting a bit tense or going the wrong way, try to find out the cause, try to resolve it straight away. Otherwise it tends to build up until eventually you explode, right? And when you explode or you argue about small things, it's a very bad idea. And uh, this is often how uh, human beings are. We don't really want to get angry, we don't want to argue, so we hold it in until we can't hold it in anymore. And then kind of we erupt like a volcano <laughs> at some particular point. Uh, so this is uh, 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 how things go, and it's kind of interesting to know that this was kind of the background story. Uh, and there's almost a schism in the Sangha because of that. Uh, and then uh, this monk goes to the Buddha, yeah, and he says to the Buddha, he bows down, uh, and he says, please come out of compassion, right? Uh, this is a nice way of putting it. Uh, uh, the uh, anukampa down here is the word for compassion. Uh, the word anukampa is like a beautiful word. Kampa is to shake or to tremble. Uh, tremble might be a nice word. So anu is a prefix that means something like along with. So like you tremble along with someone else. Uh, and if you really have compassion towards somebody, it's like you can feel almost like a trembling because you see the suffering in another being. Yeah? And then you want to help, you want to do something. Yeah? And this is expressed in this word, anukampa. Huh? So uh, if you want a monk or a nun to do something, yeah, and you want to invite them to give a talk, or you want to invite them to visit someone in hospital or whatever it is, uh, this is the right way to ask. Please come out of compassion, yeah? Because this is the motivating force uh, for monastics, usually, and especially the Buddha. Remember the Buddha, the whole reason for the Buddha's uh, decision eventually to uh, um, teach uh, is compassion for the world, right? I didn't actually read that part of the uh, uh, in the um, Arya Pariyasana Siddha, the Noble Surge, where the Buddha decides to teach in the world, but he decides out of compassion. He looks out with the eye of the Buddha, he looks out into the world, uh, and he sees people who are sunk in delusion, sunk in suffering, uh, and he knows that he has the answer. Uh, and because he knows he has the answer, compassion arises. Uh, and then he goes into the world and starts teaching the Dhamma. It's always compassion that is the motivating force uh, for a good for the Buddha specifically, but also really for any good monastic uh, in teaching or helping out one way or another. That's a nice way to, to write. Yeah? So uh, if you really want Ajahn Brahm to come to KL Bobby, uh, please say, out of compassion, please, please, out of compassion, come to KL and see, <laughs> see what happens. Uh, yeah. this is, don't, don't tell him I said that, because he might not be too happy if I give away the trade secrets, but, uh, <laughs> but there you are. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> the Buddha consented with silence. This is how the Buddha usually consent, uh, consents by silence. Uh, All right, let's stop there and just do five minutes of meditation and then we'll carry on in a second.
<clears throat> okay. So, uh, any questions or comments, please? Uh, we can take those now. Uh, wonder, um, Buddha has immense psychic power, right? Yeah. And even then, yeah. the psychic power can't resolve. <laughs> the yeah. yeah, exactly. But this is what is interesting, right? This is one of the reasons why this is so fascinating. Because again, it sometimes we, I think we think about the Buddha in the wrong way. Yeah? And we, um, you know, we we are used to hearing about the Buddha, all the later stories where the Buddha has so many powers and we think that the Buddha can resolve anything. It's like the Buddha is greater than the world. And, but actually the Buddha is just a human being, yeah. And there's a limit to what a human being can do. And we will see this in a second when, you know, when the Buddha actually does go to those monks uh, and he is not able to really resolve that issue. Uh. And uh, I think there's m probably many things going on here, but one thing I think is that uh, uh, you, you know, sometimes you just have to allow people to resolve things themselves. Uh, you cannot really always interfere in everything uh, because you never, people never learn. It's like you, if you have kids, uh, then sometimes you just have to allow the kids to make mistakes and they have to learn from the mistakes. You can't always resolve everything for your kids. Uh, they never learn anything. Yeah. And this is one reason, I think, why this is this way because the Buddha basically he wants to allow the monastics to resolve. Uh, but another thing is just that the Buddha has limited powers, like everyone else. Uh, he doesn't have, he's not like a universal kind of force or anything like that. He's a human being, yeah. and there's a limit to even what the Buddha can do. Uh, and if you, know, if you were in the presence of the Buddha, if the Buddha was here, you would probably be surprised. You would see the Buddha, you know, as a human being. It wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't kind of be awed in the way you are. The reason we are so awed by the Buddha is because of all the history and all the extra layers of things that came afterwards. Uh, but actually in reality he comes across as human just like anyone else when you meet him. So there's very, I think the limits of the Buddha are far greater than what we think they are usually. Yeah. Yeah. Ajahn, good morning. Um, good morning, yes. Okay. Uh, actually, is, this is a very interesting uh, sutta bhakti because I'm just having a bit of an argument. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you wounding each other with the swords of the mouth, or are you? Uh, uh, no, no, we haven't <laughs> got to that stage yet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, so actually, I'm quite curious about the outcome of this. But the yeah. the issue that we were discussing was about attachment. Attachment. Yeah. Uh, and at which point do you? How do you let go of the attachment? Uh, because for me, I feel that you have to accept the attachment, yeah. but then you slowly let it fade away. Uh, my friend over here has a different view because he says one of the suttas says otherwise. Maybe you want to add that. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Uh, it's about uh, Abhi Nandati, Abhi uh, Vadati, Ajosayo Titati. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the process is when we have certain delight in something, yeah. we don't talk about it, we don't remain holding. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's it. So yeah, sure. So I would, I, I think you're both right. Yeah. So that this is right. <laughs> because the, the truth is that I, ideally we shouldn't hold on to these things. That's true, we shouldn't. But sometimes we have no choice, and it's actually very hard to let go. Huh? So sometimes we have to have a long-term strategy to learn to let go. In the meantime, we actually ha it's because we have a sense of self, actually it's sometimes very difficult to let go. Huh? So we try. If we can let go, good. If we can't, then uh, you know, we have to carry on. And very much of the, uh, the process of the whole Buddhist path is actually a process of developing even those things that are kind of ultimately defilements, like craving and attachment and the conceit I am, because they are part and parcel of who we are as human beings, uh, uh, we sometimes we have to, instead of 
letting go of them all at once. We have to let go of them gradually. So we let go of the more coarser defilements first of all, and we move to a higher level. We get rid of the more bad craving, and we have a lighter kind of craving. Let go of the bad attachment, go to a higher attachment. Let go of the bad conceit, go to more refined conceit. And from that more refined state, we can then let go more completely. Huh? So, um, so this is the same thing with views. Yeah, you have a view about something here, yeah, and maybe you are attached to that. View. Maybe you are attached to the idea of rebirth. Okay, it's okay to be attached to rebirth. It's a kind of a stepping stone to move forward. Uh. But then you try to be aware of your attachment. Uh. And it's kind of interesting, when you are aware of your attachment, uh, then you also become more uh, careful with how you argue with other people about it. Yeah, Because you know, I'm attached here, it means that I can very easily fall into an argument with others. Uh, because if other challenge my attachment, uh, it's going to feel bad for me. Yeah? And so you get into an argument easily. So by being aware of your own attachment, uh, you can stop yourself by, before you get into arguments with others. Uh. And this, I think this is what is happening here with these monks. They are obviously attached to small rules in the Vinaya and taking this far too seriously uh, and not really dealing with it in the right way. Uh. So, uh, so that, that, is, uh, that is the issue. So I think, I, I would say you're both, you're both right. Uh, it's just different angles on the same, the same thing, yeah, yeah. And the world is often like that. We, very often we end up arguing with each other. And the reason we argue is not always that we disagree. It's just that we haven't really listened properly to the other person and tried to understand where we're coming from. When you start listening to other people properly, you realize they have part of the truth. You have part of the tr truth. Uh, and sometimes when you join forces, you see, see more of what's going on. Yeah, it's the famous story of the elephant, uh, yeah, the, the, the blind man and the elephant. Yeah, you know that story, uh, of course. Uh, yeah. Anyone does not know the story of the blind man and the elephant? Uh? Okay, there's a few at the back there. Wow, not, okay. Story, <laughs> okay, story of the blind man, very briefly, right? So there's an, an elephant, uh, and there is uh, seven blind men, yeah? And the, the, these blind men, they each one get to feel one part of the elephant, uh, and then they have to tell someone else who, what that is, the thing that they're feeling, yeah? So one blind person feels the leg, and he's like, yeah, the elephant is a post, yeah? And one gets to kind of feel the ear. Yeah, the elephant is like a fly whisk. Yeah, kind of flying, whisking away the flies. Uh, and one gets to feel the trunk. Yeah, the elephant is like a hose, like a fire hose or something like that. And one gets to feel the body. The elephant is like a sol large mass of rock. I can't remember exactly what it is. So each blind man has a different idea, right, of what the elephant is because they feel a different part of the body. Yeah. And then afterwards they get these blind men together to discuss what the elephant is. And because they all felt a different part of the body, they argue with each other and quarrel. No, the elephant is this. No, you idiot. It's like this. You imbecile. It's like this. And then they get into a big fight because of that. Uh, but if they had got together uh, and they had actually, each one of them, seen their side of the story, actually they would have been able to describe the elephant quite well. Uh. And life is often like that. Yeah, we often, everyone has a partial truth. And when we understand the par our own partial understanding of reality, then actually we can listen to others in a new way, and we can maybe learn something from others uh, because they will have a different angle on these things. Uh, that's that story uh, of the, um, which is actually a very nice story and uh, kind of one of the uh, beautiful Buddhist stories. Uh. Anyway, yeah. Mm. Okay, to people that are uh, learning about Buddhism, mm. you know, some people, you know, study this and uh, mm. they say, well, this is the core Buddhism. Some, you know, like maybe Abhidharma, Sutta, whatever. Mm. And it's uh, <coughs> another comparison, isn't it? <coughs> in, in Thai, we have. Yeah. <coughs> like, you know, like the blind man touched the yeah, elephant yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it explain how that the elephant yeah. looks like. It's like people that study learning about Buddhism and whatever yeah, sure. part yeah. of they think yeah. is important and that, and that is Buddhism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, of course, yeah, absolutely. I think that's true, but I think it can be applied very, very broadly uh, to whenever we disagree about anything. But of course, when it comes to the Buddhist teaching, it's probably the most important, uh, some of the most important parts. We don't argue too much about the, the Buddhist teachings. So. No, um, my point is, in Thai, we have that story. Y yeah. Maybe 
me and in the tomb. No, everyone had this, this, this is this is from the Udana, right? It's from this one of the core teachings in the suttas. So yeah. we all we all have that story. Yeah. 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 All right. So let's uh, carry on. And uh, so the Buddha consents with silence. Uh, then the Buddha went up to those mendicants and he said, uh, "Enough, mendicants." Uh, Stop arguing, quarreling, and disputing here. So what do you think the monks will say if the Buddha came to you and he said, you, said to you, stop arguing? What would you say? You'd probably say, oh, oh yes, sir, and you'd probably, you know, you'd probably be happy. Do you think the monks said that? Of course not. Sir. <laughs> when he said this, one of the mendicants said to the Buddha, Wait, sir! <laughs> Let the Buddha, the Lord of the Dhamma, remain passive, dwelling in blissful meditation in the present life. <laughs> so this is not a good way to answer when the Buddha <laughs> asks you to stop quarreling, right? He's, he's kind of polite on the surface, but actually, really, it is not really polite at all, because he's just trying to dismiss the Buddha, not listening to the Buddha. And uh, here you get this feeling that the the way they saw the Buddha is very different from the way we see the Buddha. Here you get the feeling that they see almost the Buddha as just one of the monks, among many monks. Yeah? And of course he has a higher standing yeah, than everyone else, uh, but he's not kind of some superhuman thing at all. Here he's just one of the group of people, and they say, oh yeah, you know, we, we respect you and you are special, but actually, please just leave us alone. We, will, we want to continue the argument. Yeah? That's what they say, basically what they're saying here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so it, it is very dismissive, and I would say this is obviously quite rude to treat the Buddha in this in this way. Obviously, uh, and uh, so, but this is the way things go sometimes, uh, especially when you are arguing in a group. We shall see this later on. When you are part of a large group, everyone is arguing together. You become extra stupid in those situations. Uh, we will be known for this arguing, quarreling, and disputing. Yeah, it's our, it's our problem. Please just uh, you know, don't don't get involved. For a second time, the Buddha says the same thing. Yeah, everything in the suttas happens three times. Yeah? <laughs> for a third time, the Buddha said to those mendicants, yeah, "Enough, mendicants! Stop arguing, quarreling, and disputing." Yeah? And for a third time, that mendicant said to the Buddha, Wait, sir, let the Buddha, the Lord of the Dhamma, remain passive, dwelling in blissful meditation in the present life. We will be known for this arguing, quarreling, and disputing. Yeah. So uh, there, you, there you are. This is not the way to deal with the Buddha. So what do you think the Buddha does at this point? This is kind of where it gets interesting. Yeah, what does the Buddha do if he sees that actually he is not able to resolve the dispute? And uh, then, of course, we shall see in a second what the Buddha does. Um, and the, the he left exactly. Yeah, you know, you know the story. He leaves, right? He goes away. Yeah. And that's a kind of a powerful technique. Yeah, if you if you cannot kind of change anything, if you stay, then and you have no power anyway, then sometimes you are. I don't know, it's almost like you are kind of showing almost a weakness in a sense. You cannot leave, you are attached to it or something. But if you show that you are completely aloof, and in the end you don't really care whether those monks are arguing or not, uh, then they start to realize, actually it is our problem. It is not the Buddha's problem at all, it is our problem. So when the Buddha leaves and they realize they could lose the Buddha, that's when they start to value the Buddha as a person, as a teacher. So leaving can sometimes be useful, right? So sometimes, Bobby, when it gets too much, you just walk out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you? Are you at the back there somewhere? Okay. <laughs> oh, in the Kusambia Sutta, yeah, that's that's true. So that that Sutta also kind of comes into that into this. It's not entirely clear when that happens, though, whether it happens later on or happens at this point. So it is a little bit unsure. 
So I guess you have to always feel the situation, what is appropriate at any one particular time. That's true in the Kosambika Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 48, by the way, yeah, just to keep that in mind. Yeah, that's also, that's, I forgot to mention that before, that's also another sutta which kind of connects with, uh, with this, this sutta here. Yeah. Okay, so um, then the Buddha robed up in the morning and taking his bowl and robe, he entered Kosambi for alms, yeah, the traditional way for monastics to get alms food. After the meal, on his return from alms round, he set his lodgings in order. Taking his bowl and robe, he recited these verses while standing right there. Yeah, setting his lodging in order, what that means is that you are ready to depart. That's what it means, because uh, you kind of uh, sort out your lodging, your, your resting place, your hut or whatever it is, uh, and that means that you are. So the Buddha is now about to leave, but before he leaves, uh, he speaks these verses. Uh, and these are the verses I mentioned before that are very famous. They are found in the Vinya Pitaka, they are found in the um, Dhammapada, and they are also found here, so they are found everywhere. Uh, and uh, so they are very interesting verses and uh, considered kind of a core part of uh, the Buddhist teachings. And if you like these kind of verses, uh, I would really recommend you to check out the Dhammapada and read that uh, every night when you're about to go to bed. Uh, if you have a little night table, uh, n bed bedside table, uh, you have the Dhammapada there, you read a verse, uh, Dhammapada, and you sleep really well afterwards. Oh, Dhammapada in your heart, yeah? <laughs> This is kind of the, the, one of the tricks to sleeping well at night. Yeah. And then you bring the Dhamma with you into your dreams. You dream about the Buddha, you dream about you know, beautiful things, uh, about the Dhamma, about Satipatthana. No. <laughs> anyway, so uh, has anyone ever had a Dhamma dream? Dream about the Dhamma? Dream about, uh, maybe dream about all the good things you're going to do? I don't know, I've never... Anyway, let's leave that, leave that aside. <laughs> okay, so these are the verses. When many voices shout at once, no one thinks that they're a fool. While the Sangha is being split, none thought another to be better. I'll just read through the whole, the whole, po the whole thing and then come back to it afterwards. Dolts pretending to be astute, uh, they talk the words right out of bounds, uh, they blab at will, their mouths agape, uh, and no one knows uh, what leads them on. Uh. They abuse me, they hit me, they beat me, they rob me. Uh. For those who bear such a grudge, uh, hatred never ends. Uh. They abuse me, they hit me, they beat me, they rob me. Uh. For those who bear no such grudge, uh, hatred has an end. For never is hatred settled by hate. It's only settled by love. This is an eternal truth. Others don't understand that here we need to be restrained. But those who do understand this, being clever, settle their conflicts. Breakers of bones and takers of lives, thieves of cattle, horses and wealth, those who plunder the nation, even they can come together. So why on earth can't you? Huh? This is the Buddha despairing at the monks being worse than the thieves. If you find an alert companion, a wise and virtuous friend, then overcoming all adversities, wander with them, joyful and mindful. But if you find no alert companion, no wise and virtuous friend, then like a king who flees his conquered realm, wander alone like a tusker in the wilds. It is better to wander alone, there is no fellowship with fools. Wander alone and do no wrong, at ease like a tusker in the wilds. So those are these famous verses and very rich and interesting verses. Uh, let's have a look at them in a bit more detail. Uh, so it starts off with this idea of many voices shouting out at once, yeah, when you are in the company of a large number of people uh, and you're kind of walking along and everyone 
is taking sides and you are kind of taking sides with somebody, uh, then you forget your independence, you forget to think for yourself, you become part of the crowd, you become part of this larger grouping here. Yeah. And be very careful with that, yeah? how, how often we take sides in conflicts and then at that moment we actually stop really being impartial and we stop being able to think for ourselves. Yeah. And one of those beautiful qualities of, uh, you know, of a stream mentor, someone who has seen the Dhamma, is that they are called independent, they are independent in the teaching of the Buddha. They will stand their ground, they know what is right, they know what is wrong, uh, and they kind of uh, just do what to them seems the appropriate thing to do. Uh. And uh, this is what, how we should all be, we should be more like stream mentors, we should stand back, uh, we should not allow ourselves to be drawn by the crowd, by what other people are thinking. Uh. But we should always pull back and ask, what is actually really right here? What is true? What is good? What is bad? Uh, instead of kind of being, um, uh, just becoming a sheep again. This is really what being a sheep is like, right? Uh, you're following along. It should be the pink sheep, uh, the black sheep, rather than the white sheep, uh, which just follows along and being foolish. Uh. So even though you're foolish, you don't think you are a fool because you're following along the crowd. Uh. And uh, this is... Um, very kind of, um, uh, very fascinating. I remember one of the things that really impressed me, I don't want to kind of keep on, no, let's, uh, let me let, let not bring that up because it's just, uh, let's leave that to one side for now. Huh? <laughs> so, um, so this is, uh, you know, already kind of an interesting idea, right? This ability to be independent, to stand your ground, to think for yourself uh, and to kind of, uh, you don't have to kind of trumpet your own personal thinking. Uh, you don't have to let the whole world know about it, uh, but quietly in your heart you know what the truth is and you follow along. Uh. And even when the Sangha is being split, uh, yeah, no one really thinks that they are at fault. Uh, no one thinks that another might have the truth uh, or be better. Uh, but you are just, uh, even though the consequences are really bad and terrible, uh, you don't have the ability to see clearly what is going on. Uh. So don't be afraid of being independent. One of the things that I have seen in the Buddhist world, there's far too much just following along others. There's far too much of, yeah, everyone says this person is an arahant, so because everyone says so, he must be an arahant. Never think like that. Because what the crowd says very often turns out to be wrong. Think for yourself, look for yourself. In the end, every one of us, we depend on our own judgment to be able to decide anything in this world. So please make sure that you trust that judgment of yours. Uh, and uh, there's too much fear sometimes in the Buddhist world. Fear of having your own opinions, fear of standing your ground. Uh, but that fear is a bad thing. Yeah? That fear is actually the problem. The problem is not standing your own ground, it's a fear which is really the problem. Uh, and be humble, of course. Be humble about your own knowledge and about your own understanding. So don't take ground unnecessarily. But don't trust other people's opinions over your own, uh, because other people are just other people, uh, and very often they have no idea what is going on. Uh, and just because a million people think someone is uh, whatever, uh, doesn't mean they're right. Uh, if the majority was right, everyone should be a Christian, because the majority of people in the world are Christian, right? Uh, so, but that's not the way, right way to think about things. Uh. Dolts pretending to be astute. The, I have translated this quite differently because, in my opinion, the, what, how, how, what is my translation like? This is my translation over here. Uh, where are we? Wow, so many verses. Uh, yeah, forgetting to speak wisely. That's my translation of that same line. <laughs> forgetting to speak wisely, and he has dolts pretending to be astute. Uh, so, <laughs> it doesn't sound like the same Pali phrase, right? It's kind of very... So, the, uh, the, the meaning here, this, the word over here, parimutta, yeah, that you have over here, what that means is that you lose your mindfulness. That's really what it means. It means that you become absent-minded, yeah? And that's why I have the idea of forgetting over here, yeah? Parimutta is forgetting, yeah? So, uh, and he... Um, Sujato, he has translated as dolts, because uh, someone who is absent-minded or whatever, he argues they are foolish, they are adult. I'm not sure if I fully agree with that translation, but anyway. 
And then we have here, you have Pandita Bhasa. Pandi Bhasa means to speak and Pandita means wise, so wise speech. Yeah. So somehow he has got pretending to be astute out of that. Again, I'm not entirely sure how he justifies that, but that's kind of, <laughs> I'm sure he has a very good reason for saying that. Uh, I have tried to argue with Adan Sujata many times, and he usually he, he has a good reason for what he says. Uh, so for, forgetting why speech or pretending, or dolls pretending to be astute, take your pick, uh, whatever you prefer. Uh, uh, <laughs> they talk. Yeah, the words right out of bounds. Yeah, because you lose your mindfulness, you are parimutta. When you lose your mindfulness, what you lose, you lose your ability to judge properly what is right and what is wrong, what is up and what is down, what is black and what is white, and you get very confused very quickly. And so you talk. Yeah, you talk the words right out of bounds. They are obsessed by speech. That's my translation there. So. A Lit little bit more similar this time, but not exactly the same. Uh, uh, they blab at will, their mouths at gape. You talk whatever you kind of comes into your mind. Yava itsanti, as you like, you talk. Yeah? And no one knows uh, what leads them on. Yeah, You are not aware, you lose your ability to understand what leads you on. Uh, you are basically led on by defilement. Uh, you are led on by conceit. Uh, you're led on by being part of the crowd. You lost your idea to be wise, lost your idea to be circumspect. Uh, and you think that you're wise when actually you're being completely foolish. Uh. So be careful. Uh, yeah? be, be wise. Take a step back when you see an argument. Uh, uh, and uh, be, be astute with these things. This is really what the Buddha is saying here. Fools kind of gather together around arguments, taking sides, uh, losing the sense of what is appropriate. Uh. They abused me, they hit me, they beat me, they robbed me. For those who bear such a grudge, uh, hatred never ends. Yeah, so this is very common in the world, uh, thinking that other people are treating you badly. Have you ever had that feeling that other people are treating you badly? Is there anyone who has never had that feeling? Yeah. Okay, it's impossible not to have that feeling, right? Everyone has this feeling, yeah. There's always people who say bad things, always people who treat us in the wrong way. And this is just part of life. And so then the question is, how do we react to that? If someone treats you badly, if someone hurts you with the verbal dagger or with maybe even physically they might hurt you, or they, you know, they might think things about you or whatever, how do we deal with other people who treat us badly? How do you deal with that thief who breaks into your house and steals your most valuable possessions? Uh, how do we deal with it? That is really the question. Uh, and if you bear a grudge because of these things, uh, hatred never ends. Uh, yeah, it goes in cycles. Uh, hatred begets hatred. Uh, and it goes round and round. I remember I, I, I found this so fascinating when I was reading about this. I was reading about the, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, yeah? the Afghanistan, the, uh, uh, the Americans, uh, yeah, well, if the British were in Afghanistan back in the 19th century, they were invading Afghanistan, and more recently then the Russians invaded Afghanistan, and then the Americans <laughs> invaded Afghanistan. Poor country, yeah? one nation invading after the other. Yeah? And I remember the uh, Afghanis, uh, what they were saying, yeah? they were saying, yeah, you know, these Western nations, they never give up. Uh, we still remember Alexander the Great coming from the West uh, yeah? and invading our country. Yeah? You remember Alexander the Great? Yeah, He invaded, he kind of conquered large part of the Middle East and up to Iran, all the way up to parts of India. And this is 2,300 years ago. And in Afghanistan, they are still bearing a grudge because of Alexander the Great yeah, coming into the country. Yeah, The Western nations, they never change. They still, you know, we still remember Alexander the Great. And that's kind of the sign of madness to me. If you bear a grudge, uh, the grudge gets passed down from one generation to the next one. Yeah, Son, daughter, remember Alexander the Great invaded our country. Never forget that. Yeah, Carry it on to the next generation. And on and on it goes. Uh, and this is the madness of human beings. This is how we are sometimes. Uh, and so uh, this is exactly the wrong way. Uh. So what is the right way? The right way is as follows. Uh, 
They abused me, they hit me, they beat me, they robbed me. For those who, who bear no such grudge, uh, hatred has an end. People will abuse you. People will sometimes even hit you. People will rob you sometimes. This is what life is like. And sometimes we just have to accept the reality of life. And we have to understand those people in the right way. And when we do that, it is actually possible to receive abuse and just shrug your shoulders and not worry about it. And this is really the right way of doing things. So again, how is that possible? And this is, I think, one of the most interesting and important things of practical Dhamma lessons. How to deal with these difficulties in life, yeah? especially when other people are very, very difficult. How can we deal with that and not get angry with other people? It's such an important part of the Buddhist path because this is where the deeper kind of purification happens. And the answer is very simple. It's extremely simple. It's just a matter of having to carry it through, to work on it, to develop these kind of ideas in your mind, to get that right view established we've been talking about. Uh, the answer is very simple, because if someone abuses you, uh, it has nothing to do with you. Uh, it has to do with them. They are the ones who have the problem. Uh, you happen to be there at the wrong time, the wrong place. Uh, and if, but it have, if it had been another person, a little bit like you, they would have received that abuse instead. Uh, and that proves that it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the abuser. At that particular point in time, when they steal something, when they abuse you verbally or whatever it is, even if they hit you physically, the reason why they do that is because their conditioning is such. At that point, all of these things come together. They can't stop themselves from doing that. They become like a robot. They're acting out an inner compulsion uh, that is so strong, uh, they're unable to resist that compulsion inside of them. Uh, that is what is going on. Uh. And what is so un unfortunate about this is that I think that almost all people in the world, I think we all want to be kind at the end of the day. Uh. We want to actually look after other people. We want to do the right thing. Uh. I know what it is like with me. I would like to be kind to people all the time if I can. Uh. Because I know that if I am kind, it is good for me and also good for the other person. Uh, kindness leads to happiness all around for everyone. Uh, and I think intuitively we'll, we all know this deep down that this is actually the truth. Uh, and yet despite the fact that we know this, uh, sometimes uh, the forces that drive our actions are so powerful, uh, they are so strong that we cannot stop ourselves from doing bad even though we know we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, and once you see that in another person, uh, that they are compelled to do things that goes against their own interest, uh, when you see that in the other person, uh, when you know that they are doing things that lead to their own suffering, when actually what they really would like to do is to be kind, but they can't stop themselves, uh, at that point you can have compassion for the person, uh, because you know they are in a trap. Uh, they are trapped by their conditioning, they are trapped by their past, they are trapped by maybe their past lives, by their upbringing, by whatever it is, and they cannot stop being the way they are. Then you can have compassion for an abuser. Right there, they are in your face, treating you badly, and you can have, feel almost sorry for them. You don't know what you're doing. You're blind. Don't say this to them, right? But just think it. Yeah. <laughs> You don't know what you're, you're, you are blind, you are deluded, uh, you are trapped by your personality, you are trapped by the past. Uh, yeah, you have no idea what's going on. Uh, that's what you think. And then when you think that, you have compassion for this person because you know that they are, in a sense, digging their own grave. Uh, they are creating their own future suffering in a very, very big way. Uh, and the moment you have compassion for them, actually you want to help them. Uh, how can I help this person to get out of this? Uh, and then maybe an opportunity will open up at some point uh, where you can actually help that person to come out of that trap of abusing, uh, robbing, thieving, stealing, treating other people badly. Uh. And this is a very powerful thing because, uh, and the reason why it is so powerful is because uh, when we feel that other people are treating us badly, uh, then our world becomes very small uh, because the world outside seems hostile. Uh, it seems scary, other people seem frightening to us. Uh, and then the world becomes me, me, me against the world outside. And actually, that is a very unpleasant place to be. Uh. 
But the moment you have compassion, instead of going into your own little world, your mind expands out. Uh, and you encompass everyone in the world, including the abuser. Uh, and instead of going into your own little world, your mind goes out to everyone and it expands out. And that broad, large mind that has compassion, and maybe even a sense of love, if you like, uh, for the whole world around you, is such a liberating kind of experience uh, compared to the small mind that withdraws into it itself uh, and sees the world as hostile. Uh, this is the power of a very simple shift in perception. This is so simple, right? Uh, the only difference is how you think about the person who is abusing her. Uh, that is the whole difference. Uh, you look at them in a new way. Uh. So why is this so hard to do? Uh? And the reason why it, it actually it isn't that hard to do. What you need to do is you need to train yourself and you'll be able to do this. But the reason why it can be hard to do is because of the idea of the sense of self. Yeah? We are used to thinking of ourselves as I am in charge. Yeah? I can do whatever I want. I make choices. If I abuse someone else then it's my fault because I decided to abuse them. We are trapped by the sense of self. And because we are trapped by the sense of self, we think that that person is responsible for their actions. Uh, that is the problem. Uh, that is why we judge them, rather have compassion for them. Uh. So this is where the Buddhist idea of non-self comes in. Uh, that actually our choices, uh, we cannot choose our choices. Uh. Our choices, our decisions, our intentions are pre-made by all kinds of causes and conditions. Uh. If you go to the very famous Anattalakkana Sutta, the characteristics of non-self, the second discourse of, of the Buddha, the Buddha specifically says, you cannot choose your choices. Uh, I cannot have my sankharas be this way or that way. Sankhara is choice, sankhara is intention, sankhara is the will, it is what we are willing. You cannot choose those. The will is preconditioned. What you do does not come from a self, it comes from cause and conditions outside you and within you. So we need to get away from this idea that we are really responsible for all of these things. Uh, if there is a responsibility, it's only a tiny, tiny little bit. I would say at the end of the day, there is nothing. It feels like we are responsible, but remember, a lot of the things that we feel in this world are the result of delusion. Uh, this is kind of the problem, right? This is exactly why we have the Buddhist path. Uh, so if you feel responsible, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are responsible. That could be a delusion. Uh, what you actually do at any one time, says the Buddha, is really the result of all the cause and conditions working on you at that particular time. Even though it feels like you are voluntarily picking up these glasses uh, or voluntarily having coffee. <laughs> it's not my fault, right? It's just happening. <laughs> it's a nice excuse, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so okay, don't stay there. So, <laughs> Bobby has conditioned me, but very, very kindly, very, very kindly conditioned. I have to say, Bobby and Ang working together very, with a lot of kindness. That's much appreciated. But so, yeah, we have to get out of this idea where we feel that I am responsible. I have done this because I want to do this. No, it is cause and conditions coming together. And once you see that in yourself, to some extent, you can start to see it in others. When you start to see it in others, you can start to see it in yourself. Then forgiveness becomes possible. Huh? Very often in the world, how do we forgive each other? Yeah, forgiveness can be very hard. If someone really has wronged you in life, how can we actually forgive? Huh? And this is how you do that forgiveness. Huh? Very often we say in Buddhism, oh, you must forgive, but we don't give people the tools that are required for, forgive, for forgiveness to happen. You need the tools. You need a new way of thinking about people. Otherwise, you can't really forgive. This is the way of thinking about people. If they are not really responsible for their actions, but their programming is responsible for their actions, if they are like a robot, like the red light or whatever, then of course you can forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. This is the right way to think. When someone, next time someone abuses you, try this. But don't wait till it actually happens. Build up this idea beforehand. Try to really understand what is going on. Look into yourself. Look at how conditioned you are as a human being. Yeah? Yeah? Look at how your habits, the way you are, what you eat, almost everything you do comes from past causes and conditions. Uh, try to understand yourself better. Yeah? And when you understand yourself better, you also understand other people better. Then you can forgive yourself 
You can forgive others. You can forgive everyone. Uh, and then life becomes far more bearable, uh, far more easy. We don't have to carry, carry around all the guilt, all the shame, and all of these kind of stupid things that we carry with us. Uh, there's nothing to be ashamed about. Uh, we're just human beings. Uh, there's nothing to feel guilty about. Uh, we're just doing you know, our best in this world. And that is marvelous already. People using the best intentions, living in a good way. Uh. So this is how you overcome these things. You don't overcome it by stopping abuse or stopping bad things, uh, because that is impossible. Uh. The world is built in such a way, there always will be abuse, uh, there always will be wars. Uh. It's a terrible thing to say, but that is the reality of the human condition. Uh. We need to do something else, and what we need to do, we need to change ourselves. That's the only place where we have real power. Uh. Changing the world is a, fool, is a fool's game. Uh. We can't change the world. We can change the world a little bit, uh, yeah? and if, especially if you get other people on board, but only a tiny little bit. Uh. You are one person among eight billion. How much power do you have? Almost zero. The one person you can change is yourself. Uh. That is where we need to do the work, uh, and that is where the change really happens. Uh. Let's do a little bit more meditation here.
So, any comments or questions, please? Over here, in the foot towards the front here, Bobby. Yeah. Good morning, Ajahn. Good morning. Uh, yeah. Uh, with regards to this, Kosambi, uh, the fighting, the quarrel here. I remember they got one sutta regarding uh, the quality that uh, easy to be admonished. I think Anumana Sutta. I think to be easily admonished is one yeah, of the qualities. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep. So, yep. can you explain more? And then one more is that I remember yep. there is a miracle that uh, Buddha praised among all the miracles, which is miracle of uh, instruction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you explain <laughs> that? Thank you. Sure, yeah. Okay, so uh, the first question is about the uh, being easy to admonish is one of the qualities of a, of a good monastic or a good layperson for that matter. Yeah. And uh, it's very, very true. Yeah. And uh, the idea there is just that uh, you should always be open to hearing other people's um, you know, corrections or whatever. Yeah. And uh, if you really are trying to live well, if, that is, if you have integrity and honesty about that, then you will be open to ad admonition because you will be interested to improve your ways if you can. Yeah? So anyone with integrity, anyone who is a truly a good person, they will be able to listen. Yeah? So what you do then is you listen to someone's admonishment and sometimes you realize the other person is just angry with you, okay, so you can just forget about it. Yeah? It doesn't matter what they say anyway. Yeah? But so occasionally people will have something useful to say here. Yeah? Especially if it is someone wise who is talking to you, yeah, someone you feel you have respect for. Huh? And then you listen, and then you ask yourself, are they right? They may still be wrong, in which way, in which case you don't have to worry about it. But if you know that they have, some, have a point, of course, then you take it on board. Huh? And there's a beautiful saying in the Dhammapada which says that when someone points out a fault in you, it's like they are uncovering a treasure huh, for you. Huh? And the reason why it is a treasure is because this helps us to develop our mind and to actually go further. Huh? And the real treasure in the world is the cultivation of the mind. Uh, that is where the real happiness is to be found. Uh. So uh, that is, uh, so yes, so a very important point. Then you have the miracle of uh, instruction, the Anusasana Patihariya, it's called in the Pali language. Uh. And this is kind of the, this is found in, among other places, in the Kevada Sutta, in the Diganikai number 11. Huh? And in that sutta is very fascinating. There's a, it starts off by this um, fellow who goes to the Buddha and he says to the Buddha, well, please do more supernormal powers. We want to see more supernormal powers because then more people will become Buddhist as a consequence. They will get faith in the Dhamma. And then the Buddha says, I am disgusted, I abhor, I detest these supernormal powers. It's a very powerful thing, right? I, in, uh, in the present day, when you talk about supernormal powers, about flying through the air or walking on water or, or this kind of things, people say, wow, that's really cool stuff. Yeah, I want to see more of that. Uh, or uh, reading of minds or whatever. But actually, the Buddha says the opposite. Uh, this is actually, to him, is, uh, is a problem. Uh, and of course, the reason it is a problem is that people will have a tendency to dismiss them as a magic trick. And we know that's exactly what happens. Uh, yeah. The majority of people in the world don't believe in these kind of things. And when they dismiss it as a magic trick, actually it usually tends to get worse. So there are other things that are far more in interesting on the Buddhist path. And things that really are interesting are, of course, the things that change our lives for the better in a real way. Not some kind of entertainment. Yeah, someone flying through the air. It's just entertainment for a while, right? It doesn't really do very much to you. It has a kind of wow factor. It's like seeing some kind of magician on TV. There's a famous clip on TV about this magician walking on water. I don't know if you've seen that. There's a kind of a clip. There's a fellow called Dynamo. He's, he's a magician. And he, this is a, the River Thames in London. Have you been to see the River Thames in London? I used to live in England, so I know what, what, it, what it looks like. And this is at, next to the Waterloo Bridge. And there's like a little kind of um, pontoon on the water. And this magician, he steps off the pontoon onto the water and he walks on the water, right? Uh, and the camera kind of pans the people standing on the bridge looking down on this magician. People are... <laughs> I think that kind of, this is the Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. Yeah, he's walking onto the water. People are really kind of mouths, really agape. They wonder what's going on. Uh, it's a very simple magic trick. When you know what he's doing, it's super, super simple. Uh, 
But uh, so the point is that these things are not really important. What is important is what actually changes our lives for the better. And uh, one of those things is the miracle or the wonder of instruction, the Anusasana Patihariya. And what that means, and the Buddha explains, is that if you explain someone the Dhamma, even though the Dhamma is so profound, even though the Dhamma is about things like non-self, and seeing things that are almost impossible to see because they go against the grain, still people have the ability to see that if you instruct them in the right way. That is the miracle of instruction. Uh, you're able to see things that are almost impossible to understand in the world uh, because the instruction is so powerful or the instruction works in a certain way. That is the interesting miracle from the Buddha's point of view. Uh, that's kind of fascinating. yeah. So. Uh, Next time you hear people talking about these marvelous stories and things, then uh, think, uh, yeah, yeah, I know better, uh, <laughs> or, or whatever. Uh. So that is my answer, answer to you. Please, uh, um, yes. Uh, do you have a, do you have a uh, Le Yong in front here? Uh. Good morning. Uh, but oh, sorry. No, you, yeah. yeah. She was first. Okay. Yeah. Le, Le Yong, just hold on one second. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. My uh, apologies. Yeah. I forget what I Say. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. yeah, with due respect, uh, Ajahn, I was just wondering, what would you say to all the women, the abused women or this women rights, telling them all you victims are just happen to be there, they're all due to conditions. I I feel quite strongly because yeah. Yeah. in our line of work, we have, you know, dealing yeah. with human rights, yeah. group, human rights, yeah. women's group, sure. abused children. Yeah. And yep, you tell yep, them, yep, uh, yep. you happen to be there, and you're there, all conditions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, most of yeah. the perpetrators are men. Yeah. So I feel very strongly, yeah. if, what would the Buddhists tell yeah. the women who has been yeah. raped, who has been abused? Yep. And, uh, and even you mentioned Afghanistan. Of yeah. course, the thing is still going on. I mean, the yeah. Americans just pull out. Yeah. yeah the Russians, yeah, the British, yeah. the be liars and all that. So... Yeah. I, I don't know. In that case, our religion seems too passive. And uh, too, I mean, I, I get it, the point, yeah. how to forgive. But in, unless there is a method or the solution to forgive, how to forgive. Sure. But, but you know, uh, like the recent case hmm. of this lady, a social influencer, yeah. who was basically chopped to pieces. Yeah. I, I don't know sure whether you have read of the Iran, news. Iran or something. No, like Hong, Kong. No. Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Oh, okay, Hong Kong. And oh, Hong was Kong. killed by the yeah. basically okay. the husband, yeah. the father-in-law, and the hmm. brother-in-law, hmm. and she was basically chopped to pieces, hmm. and some parts of her were put in the in the pot, okay. be cooked as yeah. soup. So I don't yeah. know how do you tell them and say, oh. Just a matter of it's conditions. So it's completely, I, 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 with due yeah, respect, yeah. Ajahn. No, no, it's not, no, no, it's, no, it's good. There's no, no need for any due respect. That's good. Uh, I thank you for bringing it up because this is an important point. Uh, so you have to. I think what we have to do, we have to distinguish between two different things. Uh, and one thing is uh, how we react to those things externally, and one thing is how we th try to see things internally. Uh, one thing has to do with our personal practice. One is how we deal with the with, with the world. Uh, so these are two kind of slightly different things. And uh, so I would say that when you have abuse, of course you should do something with it. Of course, absolutely. Uh, and to not do something with it is crazy. Uh, and uh, so we should try to create society that is more fair, where there is less abuse going on. We should do what is necessary. If there is abuse, we should walk away. We should not stay in relationships that are abusive. It is absolutely wrong. We should look after ourselves. Uh, our primary compassion should be for ourselves and kindness to ourselves. Uh, if someone is abusive, we should report it. It's okay. It's not only okay, we should report it because otherwise the abuse will go on. Uh, and this is also true in Buddhist circles. Sometimes you find abuse going on in Buddhist circles. If a teacher is a bad teacher, we should report that teacher. Why? Otherwise other people will be subject to the same abuse and will carry on. Uh, Absolutely, I 100% agree with you. And it's not about being passive. It's the wrong way. So I'm only, this is only one side of the story. I'm not telling you the full, this is the thing. You can never tell the full story when you give a Dhamma talk because there's always other sides to things. So you need to remember that. So, I, so absolutely, we should report things when they are bad. We should try to create better societies by putting the right kind of laws into the place, by putting protection into place, by having places that people can call up and people can ask for advice when they are in really serious trouble. Huh? And all of these kind of things are very, very important with you. Huh? 
And yes, there is unfortunately a lot of violence going on against women in the world. Yeah, that is certainly true. And it is a problem, and we should deal with that. Domestic abuse, all kinds of abuse, it's across the world. Every society has the same kind of problems, uh, and it is certainly something that we should deal with, uh, and very, very important. So thank you for bringing it up. And what I was saying was a very one-sided thing. I agree, very one-sided, uh, but uh, this is the way I would practice. Yeah? So if I'm, I'm saying this because in my life, uh, I don't meet with much abuse. I've had a very good childhood. I have had a very good life in many ways. I never really had to deal with these kind of things very much. But I still have to deal with it, right? On a daily basis, people saying bad things. Everyone has some of these things. Uh, and so the way I deal with it personally, when someone abuses me or whatever, which is quite rare, uh, this is how I deal with it. Uh, and this is how, ideally, in daily life, when small things happen to us, that's how we deal with it. Uh, but there's also the other side to things, and that is what you're bringing up. I fully agree with you, and I support what you're saying, just to be clear about that. Uh, um, we are running out of time, Le Yong, so maybe we can take that question uh, late, later on. No? Is that all right? Yeah? Okay. Okay, great. Uh, okay, everyone. So let's have some nice lunch together, uh, and we'll carry on at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Uh.